Thank you. Welcome, good afternoon. It's nice to see this auditorium full. My name is Katherine Wilson. I am the president of the IUPUI Senior Academy, and I am a retired faculty member from biology. Uh, and it is my pr privilege to uh, welcome you on behalf of the IUPUI Senior Academy to the 2015 last lecture presentation. Uh, the Senior Academy is an organization of retired staff and faculty whose members are actively involved in supporting the university's mission of healthcare research and education. Now, the first I knew of the phrase last lecture came from reading the best-selling book by Randy Pausch. Uh, and Professor uh, Pausch was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he used his last lecture platform to deliver some lessons of major importance uh, that he had learned over his lifetime. And this led to my belief that the last lecture had to be truly a professor's very last lecture, <laughs> very last one about his or her career at a university. Now, many of you know that uh, this isn't true he here, or <laughs> so our last lecture, uh, people are not about to die, and they're not, um, and this is not their last lecture, their very last lecture, and they're not even retired necessarily. So, and that is true on other campuses as well. There are last lectures across the campus, uh, across the uh, United States. Um, so, instead, at IUPUI, the last lecture has become a very important annual event that allows us to choose from among any of our eminent senior colleagues and to benefit from their wisdom and advice that they have accumulated throughout their distinguished career. So I would like to note once again that this event is sponsored by the IUPUI Senior Academy, but also by the IUPUI Administration and by the IU Foundation. Uh, on be so, <clears throat> on behalf of us all, I would like to welcome you to this year's last lecture presentation. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nasser Paydar, Paydar, who is the Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Academic Officer of IUPUI. And he will join me in welcoming you uh, and will offer further remarks. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for clarifying this last lecture thing because I noticed Sheila was just, before the thing, was, had a certain look on her face. <laughs> so it's not that. So it's good. Uh, <clears throat> on behalf of Chancellor uh, Pants, I want to uh, welcome all of you to IUPI campus and to the seventh annual last lecture. Um, we were uh, looking around and we saw so many people that we know and we, we had a pleasure of working with uh, for many years uh, at IUPUI that are back here, which is terrific. And uh, we happen to be sitting, Catherine, uh, David and I were sitting there, and even though the lecture hasn't started, I'll give you a quiz. What was the topic of our conversation, the three of us here? <laughs> Bill? Oh, I can't imagine. Oh, yes, it was. <laughs> This is an inside joke of uh, Purdue, IU. We are all from Purdue School, so that's what we were talking about. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to see all of you here. It's because of you that IUPUI has had the growth that it has had. I, I can't uh, pass any opportunity to talk about this campus. We, we are celebrating 20 years of consecutive growth in student credit hours which is really terrific. Yes, that's right. We not only are the campus of choice for many in this region, but we are 
attracting students from all states. Uh, actually, I lied, 49 states. If there is anyone from Maine that has relatives there, we could offer outstanding scholarships with them because... But, but we have had double-digit growth in non-residents. We've had double-digit growth in recruiting international students here, which is really terrific. Our students are involved in our community. About eight, 9,000 students this year are in our community serving through service learning and receiving credit and be involved in our community, which is terrific. About in radius of one mile from us, there is more research than any coordinate in the state of Indiana. In fact, last year, or we went up in our research with $325 million awards that we received, which was an increase compared to previous year. This year, as I speak to you in March, we are up by $90 million compared to the same time last year. This is in this environment where it's so tough to get a grant. I think that deserves So we've had an impressive background on where we are today, but you've seen nothing yet. We have put a plan together. We've begun in plan beginning implementation of IUPI plan. IU has a bicentennial plan. We have created crosswalk between the two, and we are targeting number of areas that we are working on, and we are looking forward to major growth in number of other areas as we go forward. So all of this is because of you that made us what, who we are and are making us what we are. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for coming here. I want to thank Sheila for giving the one more lecture with the recall <laughs> last lecture. I want to thank the staff of my office, especially Sue Harrell. Where are you, Sue? She's, she's right there working it. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, I want to invite uh, Dean Emeritus, David Stockholm, uh, to come to the podium to introduce our speaker, but I'm asking him not to go more than two or three minutes because he gave his last lecture. This cannot be another lecture, so <laughs> got to be brief. Here is David Stockholm. Thank you very much, Executive Vice Chancellor Paydar. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Senior Academy at IUPUI, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker for the 2015 last lecture series, Dr. Sheila Cease Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy holds an Associate of Arts degree from Stevens College for Women, a BS in Education with Honors from Indiana University, and the Doctor of Jurisprudence from Indiana University. Sheila's career has been nothing short of remarkable in its diversity, complexity, and impact. She is a teacher, researcher, writer, and civic leader. She has been university professor, worked in the legal profession, and been active in politics. Her current academic appointments at IUPUI are professor of law and public policy in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, research fellow in the Center for Religion and American Culture, adjunct professor of political science, faculty fellow in both the Center for Urban Policy and Environment and the Tobias Center for Leadership, and she is the founder and director of the Center for Civic Literacy at IUPUI. To make an understatement, Sheila Kennedy is exceptionally well informed about the details of government, politics, and civil liberties. Sheila's honors are too numerous to detail, but I'm just going to name a few. Sagamore the Wabash in 1980, the Jenks Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Field of Law, Indiana, 2002, Robert Risk Award for Lifetime Achievement on behalf of Civil Liberties, ACLU of Indiana, Alumna of the Year, IU School of Law, 2008, the Chancellor's Faculty Award for Excellence in Civic Engagement, 2010, and the Indiana Public Service Award in 2013. 
Dr. Kennedy has conducted a wide variety of externally funded research, has published nine books, numerous book chapters, and peer-reviewed research papers, and has given a prolific number of research presentations. Her service to the university has been outstanding at all levels. She has been widely sought after as a speaker and for interviews on civic matters. In addition to everything else she does, Professor Kennedy is an insightful civic commentator. She is a regular columnist for the Indiana, Indianapolis Business Journal and the Indiana Word. Now, best of all is her daily blog. I hope a lot of you here read it. This blog comments with very sharp insight on emperors with no clothes, politicians with no ethics, and people with no clue. <laughs> All of which segues quite nicely into the title of her talk, Defending Reason in an Unreasonable Time. Please welcome Professor Sheila Seuss Kennedy. I am immensely honored and flattered to be asked to give this talk, but I got to tell you, this request really threw me into a panic. Uh, last lecture sounded so portentous, <laughs> not to mention that it seems to be an invitation to share what I might know before I totter off uh, to the old folks' home or the grave. Uh, <laughs> You know, those of you in this room who know me know that I rarely have trouble sharing my very opinionated perspectives, but the task of summing up, of connecting the conclusions I've uh, reached to my life experiences and scholarship, well, it seemed and, and still seems overwhelming, but I'm here, so. I think I have been a political person in the sense that the question that has always fascinated me is how should people live to together, excuse me? What sort of social and political arrangements are the most likely to nourish our humanity and promote, in Aristotle's term, human flourishing? If the old African proverb is right, if it takes a village to raise a child, what should that village look like? And how should its inhabitants behave? How do we build that kind of village? Is the human community headed in the right direction or are we on the wrong road? My conclusions have been shaped by my life experiences as much as by my scholarship and for the last several years have been keeping me up at night. Let me begin this with a very important caveat. Unlike so many of you in this room, I am not a scholar, at least not in the traditional sense. In fact, I've been a lot, lifelong dilettante. Now, I do prefer the term generalist, but you know, as, as Popeye said, I am what I am. Uh, I've done a lot of different things over the past 50 plus years, and the result is that I know a little bit about a lot of things, but depth is not my strong suit. Over the years, however, probably as a defense mechanism, I've convinced myself that there's value in casting one's intellectual net rather widely. In my case, at least, it has allowed me to connect some seemingly unconnected dots, even when my own mastery of the subjects involved is tenuous or superficial. Let me get the biography out of the way. I was born in 1941, and I'm very much a product of the 1950s when women were expected to be decorative and submissive, or at the very least quiet, um, so you can see the problem. Um, <laughs> I grew up Jewish in Anderson, Indiana, where being Jewish was at best exotic and at worst satanic, and uh, where I was usually the only Jew my classmates had ever encountered. Those experiences undoubtedly deepened my interest in the nature of justice, 
the tendency to divide people between us and them, and the effects of marginalization. They also kindled an ongoing fascination with the ways in which religion shapes our worldviews and how it intersects and influences civil law. I left Anderson for college when I was 16. I wanted to major in the liberal arts, but my father insisted I get a teaching degree because if my eventual husband died, I'd need something to fall back on. <laughs> uh, at the time, educated women were secretaries, teachers, or nurses. I couldn't type, and the sight of blood made me vomit, uh, so I was a teacher, you know. I, uh, because I was so young, my parents sent me to Stevens College for Women, uh, which took very seriously its obligation to act in loco parentis. Um, after Stevens, which is a two-year school, I briefly attended the University of North Carolina, where the most indelible lesson I learned was that when you pay full professors $3,000 a year, you get what you pay for. Uh, this was still the 1950s, but even then, $3,000 a year was not, not good pay. I transferred to IU Bloomington to finish my undergraduate degree, got married and divorced, and later did a semester at Butler, pursuing a master's in literature that I never finished. I married a second time and took my first job. Well, it was my first job, if you do not count the summer that I worked for my father's best friend at his, I am not making this up, Cadillac Rambler Agency. <laughs> uh, where I was billed, I want you to know, as the first female used car salesman in Anderson. Uh, I began my adult work life as a high school English teacher. But when I became pregnant with my first child, I could no longer teach because even though I was married, those days, once women teachers or librarians showed, we could no longer be in the classroom. I assumed the theory was that kids would know what we'd been doing. <laughs> uh, I went to law school when I was 30 and had three small children, four if you count the husband I had at that time. Uh, <laughs> There were very few women in law school then, and my most important epiphany actually revolved around the need for potty parity. Uh, the few women's restrooms had been included more or less as a grudging accommodation to the secretarial staff. After graduating from law school, I was the first female lawyer hired at what was then Baker and Daniels. And <laughs> to give you a flavor of the time, Serial interviews with prospective associates were conducted by several of the partners, and I was in conversation with two of them who were being very careful not to ask improper questions. This was barely 10 years after the creation of the EEOC. Since I had three children, I thought it was reasonable enough to volunteer my childcare arrangements. One of the partners was so obviously relieved that I wasn't going to be some kind of bra-burning feminist that he blurted out, it isn't that there's anything wrong with being a woman. We hired a man with a glass eye once. <laughs> you can't make this up. I practiced, corporate, <laughs> I practiced corporate law at Baker and Daniels uh, for three years until Bill Hudnut asked me to take charge of the city's legal department. I was the first woman corporation counsel in Indianapolis, or to the best of my knowledge, in any major metropolitan area. Uh, at the time, Indianapolis had two newspapers, and now we don't have any. Uh, <laughs> the, the afternoon paper, the Indianapolis News, had a front page gossip item, a blurb, and I still recall the juicy little item after my appointment was announced. What high-ranking city official appointed his most recent honey to a prominent position? I guess it was just inconceivable that I'd been appointed because I was a decent lawyer or even because I represented a constituency that Bill was reaching out to. I was a divorced female. Bill had a reputation, and that could only mean one thing. I left City Hall to be the Republican candidate for Congress in 1980, running against Andy Jacobs, Jr., in what was then Indiana's 11th congressional district. Now, this was back when Republicans were rational and political campaigns were less toxic. 
The worst thing I recall saying about Andy was that he was a Democrat. Uh, and my youngest son later served as his congressional page. After Andy retired, we would often have lunch together. As I say, things were different then. I also remarried during that campaign, and I am happy to report that the third time was the charm. Uh, it's been 35 years and counting. And so far, so good, okay. Uh, after the election, I practiced law, started a real estate development company that went broke during the recession of the late 80s and served six years as the executive director of the Indiana ACLU. I still remember Nouveau's headline in red, no doubt. Uh, ICLU taken over by card-carrying Republican. Um, I joined IUPUI's faculty in 1998. Like many of you in this room, I have lived through the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the 60s, the sexual revolution, the gay rights movement, the decades of religious zealotry that a friend calls America's most recent great awakening, and a dizzying explosion of new technologies. As George Burns once said, I'm so old, I remember when the air was clean and sex was dirty. <laughs> All of these experiences required me to think in different ways and from a variety of perspectives about the questions with which I began this talk. What is a just society? How do we mediate the tensions between individual rights and the common good? Who gets to decide what the common good is? Can government institutions ensure social order without doing unnecessary damage to individual autonomy? How? When I first became politically active at 19, I barely remember being 19, it was as a Republican. I was persuaded and, re and remain persuaded by what has been called the libertarian principle, the belief that the best society is one in which individuals are free to set and pursue our own life goals, determine our own telos, so long as we don't harm the person or property of a non-consenting other, and so long as we are willing to grant an equal right to others. Back then, with some notable exceptions, the GOP understood the importance of so long as in those last two caveats. Times, obviously, have changed. The political party to which I belonged then no longer exists, except in name. For those who begin with the libertarian principle as I've just shared it, good faith political arguments tend to revolve around the nature and severity of the harms that government can legitimately prohibit or regulate, and the extent of government's obligation to provide a physical and social infrastructure to be paid for through citizens' dues, called taxes. Needless to say, we're not having those good faith arguments today. Instead, we're in what may well be an existential struggle between science and reason on the one hand, and a variety of fundamentalisms characterized by the rejection of reason, evidence, and empirical knowledge on the other. My first book was, What's a Nice Republican Girl Like Me Doing at the ACLU? I wrote it while I was still at the ACLU and had begun to recognize the truly appalling extent to which the general public is ignorant of America's history, philosophy, and constitutional system. The book was intended to be sort of a chatty introduction to those subjects. In it, I first articulated something that I still call the American idea that this is a nation based not on geography, ethnicity, or conquest, but on a theory of social organization, a philosophy of governance that was meant to facilitate e pluribus unum, out of the many one. The American idea set up an enduring conversation about the proper balance between I and we, between individual rights and majoritarian passions. At IUPUI, my first major research project was a three-year study of the charitable choice provisions of 1992 welfare reform, usually referred to as George Bush's faith-based initiative. The Ford Foundation funded an, an investigation into the premises upon which that effort was based, the idea that faith-based institutions are better able to move people off welfare, 
the belief that there were armies of compassion uh, waiting to rush in to help and not so incidentally save the government money, and the belief that religious organizations had been unfairly excluded from government's contracting regimes. And of course, all of those assumptions were wrong. Empirical research failed to substantiate the superiority of faith-based nonprofits, and because most faith-based organizations that had an interest in and a capacity for working with the government were already doing so and had been welcomed, not excluded, the promised armies of compassion failed to materialize. What I really learned from that research was that the Bush administration had the foggiest notion how America's social welfare system actually worked or didn't, and far worse from my perspective, had only the dimmest understanding of the First Amendment's religion clauses. The one thing the Bush administration did extremely well was convince me that I was no longer a Republican. Um, <laughs> at the ACLU, I had recognized the extent of civic illiteracy among the general population. My charitable choice excuse me, charitable choice research introduced me to officials at the highest level of government who viewed the Constitution and Bill of Rights as nuisances to be circumvented. That research also introduced me to the immense and underappreciated influence of religious worldviews on public policy formation. Of the nine books that I've written, the two that taught me the most, the ones that required the deepest dives into our philosophy of government and suggested some answers to Aristotle's question, were God and Country, American Red and Blue, and my most recent textbook, Talking Politics, What You Need to Know Before You Open Your Mouth. I won't even tell you what the working title was. Okay. It was, <laughs> it was while researching God and Country that I came across Frank Lambert's illuminating description of the difference between the founding fathers and those he calls the planting fathers. The first set, the pilgrims, who he calls the planting fathers, did come, as we've all been taught, for, to the colonies for religious liberty. But they defined religious liberty as freedom to do the right thing. They came to America to build a shining city on the hill, and most of them believed that God not only wanted them to follow the right way, but that he also wanted them to make sure their neighbors did too. Religious freedom meant that government would establish the correct religion. 150 years later, Lambert points out, when George Washington swore to faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, he undertook to preserve, protect, and defend a constitution that those planters would have found incomprehensible. The new constitution was the product of the men we call the Founding Fathers, and it made no reference whatever to God or divine providence, citing as its sole authority the people of the United States. In the intervening 150 years, the Enlightenment had changed the way that Americans defined liberty, or at least some of them. That was an epiphany because it provided a lens through which to understand so much of our current political environment. American politics remains a contest between the numerous Puritans still among us and those I call modernists, both secular and religious. Policy making has become a power struggle between Puritans who believe that the role of government is to make the rest of us live godly lives based upon their particular version of the good, and those of us that demand that government act upon what John Rawls called public reasons, based upon logical persuasion and scientific and empirical understandings. Contemporary Puritans remain deeply antagonistic to the Enlightenment and to secular ways of knowing, especially science, and they utterly reject the notion that each of us gets to define our own morality. Scroll down a Facebook page or read the comments section of an online newspaper and you will come across posts from fundamentalists of various types who wrap themselves in victimhood whenever government fails to impose their preferred worldview on everyone else. In God and Country, I wanted to unpeel the onion to explore the ways in which ostensibly secular policy preferences are actually rooted in religious ways of seeing reality. 
in many of our current policy arguments, of course, the religious dimensions are pretty obvious. You know, think death penalty, abortion, same-sex marriage. But there are also debates about presumably secular policies in which unrecognized religious perspectives rather than data and evidence are really driving the debate. Take economic issues, particularly those involving poverty and inequality, issues where the influence of America's early Calvinism remains strong. You know, Mitt Romney may be a Mormon, but his disdain for the 47% was grounded in a culture with a deeply entrenched, if bastardized, version of Calvinism, a belief that God smiles on the elect and the poor are poor because they're morally defective. Accusations that poor folks lack middle class values are just a modern sanitized version of that theologically rooted conviction. In God and Country, I explored the religious roots of policy preferences about the economy, the environment, foreign policy, and criminal justice. And I learned a lot about different vision, versions of Christianity in the process. But what I really came to understand was the importance of paradigms, the worldviews that shape our perceptions of reality. Even those of us who consider ourselves entirely secular, who have no doctrinal religious beliefs, hold views that are rooted in early religious ways of understanding the world around us. Paradigms are where biography really matters. My views of reality and human obligation were shaped by my own religious background and culture. On my office wall is, no kidding, a cross-stitched <laughs> paraphrase of a Talmudic injunction to the effect that while God does not expect us to perfect the world in our generation, we aren't free not to try. I was raised in a congregation that regularly chanted, justice, justice, shalt thou pursue. I'm not religious, but I remain a product of a very specific culture, as we all do. And that brings us back to the question that has consumed me for most of my 73 years. What sort of social order, what kind of legal system is most likely to protect both individual liberty and the common good? Given my biography and experiences, it shouldn't be surprising that I think Enlightenment philosophers like Montesquieu and Locke and founders like Madison and Jefferson got the big parts right. Not that our constitution and jurisprudence don't have some pretty substantial defects, but the basic balance between individual autonomy and government power, the constraints on the use and misuse of that power are essential to a society that facilitates human flourishing and to a village that nourishes its children. The problem is too few of our citizens know anything about that balance or those constraints. As many of you know, I founded and direct a Center for Civic Literacy here at IUPUI because we desperately need to reinvigorate civic education. When a polity is very diverse, such as in the United States, it is critically important that citizens know at least the basic outlines of that country's history, philosophy, and governing architecture. In the absence of other ties, race, religion, national origin, a common understanding of and devotion to constitutional principles is critical to the formation of national identity and commitment to the common good. That kind of devotion is a far cry from the faux patriotism so often displayed by our least self-aware politicians. Someone needs to explain to Rudy Giuliani, for example, that Genuine patriotism has to be based on an understanding of the nation's history and institutions, the good, the bad, and the ugly, if it is to enable rather than impede deliberative discourse and democratic citizenship. It won't surprise anyone in this room that I see education, the search for truth, respect for evidence, the willingness to examine and re-examine one's most basic beliefs, as the essential key to human progress. I, I tell my students that whatever else they learn, 
I will consider my classes successful if they leave using two phrases far more frequently than they ever did before they enrolled. It depends, and it's more complicated than that. <laughs> The ability to live with ambiguity and complexity, the ability to internalize learned hands observation that the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too certain it's right, is at the heart of the human enterprise. And that pursuit is increasingly under attack. Recently, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker proposed cutting $300 million from the University of Wisconsin's budget. But even more appalling, he wanted the university's mission statement changed from basic to every purpose of the system is the search for truth to meeting the state's workforce needs. <laughs> as the New York Times wrote in a scathing editorial, it was as if a trade school agenda were substituted for the idea of a university. More recently, legislators in o Oklahoma have proposed to eliminate AP history classes in that state because they teach students negative things about America. In other words, the classes educate rather than indoctrinate. Scott Walker and those Oklahoma legislators are emblematic of the anti-intellectualism and the assault on reason and evidence that has come to characterize the American right. These shallow and ambitious politicians believe that education and job training are synonymous, that scholarly research and the search for truth are elitist non-essentials, and that humans don't need to know anything that doesn't either promote an unreflective nationalism or lead directly to gainful employment. They'd have handed Socrates that cup of hemlock in a heartbeat. My husband says I've been in a bad mood since 2000. <laughs> and he's right. <sighs> okay, the problem as I see it is twofold. First, Americans increasingly inhabit alternate realities. And the second is we no longer understand ourselves to be bound by a social contract. In talking politics, I argued for the need to distinguish between facts that have been documented and agreed to by responsible people of all ideological perspectives and the different conclusions and interpretations that can legitimately be drawn from those facts. To use an analogy from the courtroom, two sides to a conflict may stipulate to what happened, but then proceed to argue in good faith about what those agreed to stipulations really tell us. That's the way our political discourse should work, but increasingly, as we all know, it does not. We have lawmakers who reject evolution and the massive evidence of global climate change, not because they can marshal evidence, persuasive or otherwise, but because they choose not to believe it. There's mounting concern over what scholars call motivated reasoning, the tendency to cherry pick evidence and see only those things that support one's preferred beliefs. Our ability to construct our own realities has enormously increased with the precipitous decline of what has been called the journalism of verification and the advent of what Eli Pariser calls the filter bubble, the sophisticated algorithms that filter the information we get online and allow us to inhabit a world that reinforces are pre-existing biases and beliefs. Problem is, as Neil deGrasse Tyson recently put it, reality really doesn't care whether you believe in it or not. Uh, we may well have passed an environmental tipping point. Even if we haven't, the world my grandchildren inhabit will be less conducive to human habitation than the world I've lived in. I have argued that we should view environmental policy through the lens of Pascal's wager. If we act to m mitigate environmental harms, and it turns out we've been wrong about climate change, the only damage done will be to the bottom line of the fossil fuel industry, which can well afford it, and the rest of us will enjoy cleaner air and water. If, however, we ignore the 98% of climate scientists, and it turns out they were right, we risk making the planet uninhabitable. Now that seems like a no-brainer to me, but apparently you cannot reason people out of positions they did not reason themselves into. <laughs> so much for science and reason. 
In the realities occupied by our contemporary social Darwinists and historical revisionists, there is no concept of a social contract and no appreciation for the importance of the physical and social infrastructure, infrastructure required by our village. Too many of our lawmakers and pundits seem absolutely oblivious to the multitude of systems, both physical and social, that our vi village needs in order to function, let alone flourish. When those largely invisible, taken for granted networks of support don't work, or when they have been corrupted or co-opted so that they only work for some groups and individuals, a society fails to function as it should. Folks in that alternate reality object reflexively to any and all social welfare proposals, seeing them as contrary to the principles that animated the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Those people need to reread Locke and revisit, or perhaps visit, social contract theory. That theory tells us that government's job is to promote both individual freedom and the common good. Despite the increasingly hysterical rhetoric from the right, the two are not mutually exclusive and in fact are interdependent. Without a social welfare infrastructure, even the most privileged individuals can't flourish for long. Arguments about how a social safety net should be structured and the proper limits to place on government largesse are entirely reasonable and important. But those aren't the arguments we're having. Instead, we are hearing from people who believe that they are entitled to the benefits of the physical and social infrastructure we all pay for, but disfavor. I have been absolutely astonished by the vituperative and inhumane opposition to the Affordable Care Act, AKA Obamacare. Opponents aren't arguing for alternative programs. They've made it quite clear they simply don't want their taxes used to provide health insurance for unworthy poor people. Another example is the current effort in Indiana and elsewhere to exempt so-called Bible-believing Christians from compliance with otherwise applicable civil rights laws. In our system, religious citizens have absolute liberty to believe whatever they want. That's the individual rights pole of the continuum. But religious or political beliefs, no matter how sincere, don't entitle people to sacrifice their newborns or blow up abortion clinics, and they don't entitle them to engage in behavior that is contrary to America's cultural and legal commitment to civic equality. That's the public good end of the continuum. There is no religious privilege to behave in ways that we collectively deem destructive to social health. Let me just share a final few observations. Social justice is a term we don't hear very often these days. Social justice is aspirational and its elements are subject to debate. But at its heart, the concept is concerned with mutual obligation and the common good. In its broadest outlines, a just society is one that meets the basic human needs of its members without regard to their identities or social status. A society that does not draw invidious distinctions between male and female, black and white, gay and straight, religious and atheist, Republican and Democrat, or any of the other categories into which we like to sort our fellow humans. It's a society that recognizes and respects the inherent dignity and value of each person. We should want to make our village more just for many reasons, practical as well as moral. For one thing, a more equitable society is in the long-term best interests of even those people who don't feel any obligation to feed hungry children or find jobs for ex-offenders or make health care accessible. That's because in order to remain competitive in the global economy, America needs to make use of all of its talent. Social injustices that prevent people from contributing cost all of us in lo lost opportunities and unrealized promise. Now, it's obvious that a lot of Americans don't much care about wasting resources, but the second argument should be compelling even to the I've got mine and that's all that counts crowd. Democracies require stability in order to survive. 
in countries where there are great gaps between the rich and poor, in countries where some groups of people go through their lives being marginalized or despised while others enjoy privilege and respect, in countries where some people are exploited and others benefit, that stability is hard to come by. A wealthy friend of mine once put it this way, I'd rather pay more in taxes than spend my days worrying about angry mobs rioting in the streets or desperate people kidnapping my children. Even in highly individualistic America, no one succeeds solely by his own efforts. That social and physical infrastructure that I've been harping on supports and enables entrepreneurship and wealth creation. And we taxpayers have built, pardon me, built and maintained that infrastructure. And that's fine. That's what it's for. We all benefit when someone builds a better mousetrap or improves on the other guy's widget. But when that entrepreneur profits from his better mousetrap, we who supplied the infrastructure have a right to a portion of his profits in the form of taxes. We also have a moral obligation to those for whom the existing infrastructure just isn't sufficient or accessible. You know, there's a credit card commercial that says membership has its privileges. Well, membership in society should have its privileges as well. That is not an argument for massive welfare programs or redistribution of wealth. It is an argument for fundamental fairness, an argument that recognizes that we all benefit when inclusive social structures operate in the interests of all of our members. From time to time, greed and fear obscure the reality of human interdependence. Unfortunately, we seem to be living in one of those times an era characterized by an intentional refusal to recognize that there is such a thing as a common good and a willful ignorance of the importance of mutual social obligation. Addressing that willful ignorance is what social justice requires, but that's easier said than done. I am painfully aware that cultural institutions, folkways, and intellectual paradigms influence people far more than logic and reason, and that culture is incredibly difficult to change. Structural barriers and ingrained privilege don't disappear without significant upheavals or outright revolutions. We may be approaching such an, a period of upheaval, not unlike the 60s. When I look around, I see a really depressing revival of tribalism and a why and widespread expressions of a racism I thought we'd moved beyond. The election of an African-American president was a sign of progress, absolutely, but it clearly lifted a rock, and what crawled out is unbelievably ugly and destructive. The growth in inequality threatens to exceed the inequities of the Gilded Age, if they haven't already, and it's very hard to argue with those who look around and see not a republic, not a democracy, but an oligarchy. When I look at American politics today, I'm reminded of a 1999 movie called The Sixth Sense. The young boy in that movie saw dead people. I see crazy people. <laughs> I know that isn't politically correct, but how else would you characterize some of the voices dominating our public discourse? How else explain the birthers and the conspiracy theorists, the faux news pundits, and the websites peddling nativism, paranoia, and propaganda? In what universe is Sarah Palin a potential vice president? <laughs> or Roy Moore, a state Supreme Court justice, or James Inhofe, chair of the Senate Committee on the Environment? On what planet? Do people pay attention to buffoons like Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or Louis Gohmert? If I had to guess why so many of our fellow citizens appear to have gone off the deep end, why they're trying to stockpile guns, roll back women's rights, put gays back in the closet, stigmatize African Americans and stereotype Muslims, I think the answer's fear. Change is creating a very different world from the one most of us grew up in, and the pace of that change continues to accelerate. As a result, we have a lot of bewildered and disoriented people 
who find themselves in an increasingly ambiguous world. They are frantic for bright lines, clear rules, simple answers to complicated issues, and especially for someone to blame. People who are confounded by new realities, and especially people who are unhappy or dissatisfied with their own lives, evidently have a need to attribute their problems and disappointments to some nefarious other. So the old racist and sexist and homophobic tropes get trotted out. Unfortunately, the desire for a world where moral and policy choices are clear and simple is at odds with the messy reality of life in our global village. And the more these fearful folks are forced to confront that messy reality, the more frantically they cling to their theological or, or ideological touchstones. Now, it may be that this phenomenon is nothing new, that there aren't really more crazy people than there were before. Maybe thanks to the internet and social media, we're just more aware of them. I hope that's true, but I don't know. I do know that a scroll through Facebook elevates my blood pressure. <laughs> At the end of the day, what will prevent us from fashioning a social order that promotes and enables human flourishing is a continuation of this retreat into anti-intellectualism, bigotry, and various kinds of fundamentalism. We villagers only become fully human, we only flourish through constant learning, by opening ourselves to new perspectives, by reaching out and learning from those who are different. I do see some welcome signs that the fever is abating, at least in the United States, and at least among younger Americans. I would turn this country over to my students in a heartbeat. They may not be the best informed generation, but they are inclusive and intellectually curious, and they care deeply about the planet and about their communities. For my grandchildren's sake, I hope they can salvage this village we call Earth from the mess my generation is leaving them. And despite the fact that this has been my last lecture, uh, I hope I hang around long enough to see if they make it. Thank you. take questions. <laughs> but if you don't have any, they've got refreshments. <laughs> Not yet. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> we get a copy? Uh, actually, I'm going to post it to my blog on Sunday. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and given that about every sentence that you said would spawn some individual thought process. So do you have any thoughts about uh, how to promote civil responsibility without polarization? Oh boy, you know. <laughs> Sorry. You should be. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is what the Center for Civic Literacy has been focused on. I, you know, how do we encourage? I, the one thing I will say, I, I don't have an answer to the question, but I know what we. Sh I don't know what we should do, but I sure know what we shouldn't be doing. And we just we just assisted the Bar Foundation and a couple of other uh, statewide organizations in the rollout of the Civic Health Index. Some of you may have seen it. It's uh, presided over by Randy Shepard and Lee Hamilton. And Indiana uh, turnout in the last uh, midterm was dead last in the country. I think it was around 15% of eligible voters. Uh, and we have a legislature, as you know, uh, that 
there was a bill, pretty modest bill, to extend the uh, polls in Indiana to eight from six. We, we close our polls. Uh, we are the first in the country. There's a couple other states that close at six, but not many. So two more hours that might let a working person get to the polls and vote, no, close that off. We have voter ID, which was a uh, brilliant uh, solution to a problem that didn't exist, uh, in-person voter fraud. Anything that our legislators can do to make it difficult for us to vote, they're doing. And when you add to that, and I, I encourage anybody who is interested to work with the League of Women Voters, they're really focusing on gerrymandering. Because if, as one of my students said after I made my usual, I'm going to take five minutes for a sermon on why you should vote, uh, he said, I went to, to my polling place, I think he lived in Hamilton County, there were, there, nobody was running. Uh, you know, there, there's a, a slate of candidates who are unopposed. And that's because we have managed with the, with the assistance of uh, technology and computers to carve out districts where, as Julia Vaughn likes to say, our legislators choose their voters. The voters don't choose their legislators. Until we attack those systemic issues, it's going to be hard to get people to, I mean, if you go to the polls and it's a worthless I'm old, I was taught that's my civic duty and I go, but it's very difficult to say to a student who lives in a safe district with, with virtually no competition, you ought to go vote. I, you know, I don't know how we, how we get that changed since the, the people who benefit from the system right now are the people who are in charge of the system. But until we can attack the, these systemic issues, I, I don't think we're gonna be able to generate the kind of uh, civic, governmental civic activity that we would all like to see. But I will say one other thing. My students, by and large, are incredibly civically active just not through government. They've given up a lot of them on government. They are working through the nonprofit sector. They are doing all kinds of things to make their communities better places, but they're, they're not participating in government to the extent that most of us in this room would like to see. Yeah. Sheila, thank you. I'd like to build on what you just said. I'm Debbie Asbury from the League of Women Oh, Voters. Debbie, hi. Um, and actually, there is a bill in front of the legislature, and it will be heard in the Elections Committee um, Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Now, the bill, House Bill 1003, is not for redistricting reform. It's to establish a study committee, which sometimes, as we all know, that's mm -hmm. a place where good bills go to die. However, Julia Vaughn and I of Common Cause and League of Women Voters are working very hard to ensure that that committee becomes appointed by lay members uh, who have expertise, passion, rational knowledge, all those good things that you talked about today. So if anyone uh, has a free time, has free time Monday morning at nine o'clock, room 413, um, the Senate Elections Committee, just come and sit with us. Julia and I will be testifying to the degree that we need to populate that with good lay folks. And then once the committee is established for lay people, your students and others, to go to those committee meetings and we'll be making them uh, known to the broader public so that those uh, committee meetings are held accountable to really exploring real redistricting reform. So thank you. Visit my blog. <laughs> yeah, I, I blogged about it yesterday. It, it you know, it, it both sides to that controversy have uh, exaggerated their claims. Uh, but that said, in Indiana, it, it clearly, let me let me preface this by saying clearly this was aimed at the gay community. But in Indiana, gay people had no rights anyway. Uh, our Neither federal nor state civil rights laws outlaw discrimination based on sexual orientation. So if you are the cupcake maker who just can't possibly bake a cupcake and take money from a gay person, uh, 
you had perfect right to ignore him. You, you can fire people for being gay in Indiana. You can h refuse to hire somebody and say it's because we don't hire gay people. You, the only right gay people have in Indiana right now is to get married. So they could have discriminated with impunity. This was a way, as a friend of mine from the law school down south in Bloomington said, uh, it was a way of sticking a thumb in the eye of the gay community, making a point, sending a message. And as I said in my blog yesterday, if you want to send a message, use Western Union. You know, uh, we're, the sad part of this, of course, is that Indianapolis, which by and large was not in favor of the our, you know, in the center of the state, we we weren't the people pushing this, except for Scott Snyder, who you all need to vote against. Uh, you know, the uh, we're going to take the economic hit for this, uh, but you know, out in Podunk, Indiana, where they think gay people are weird, or you know, or satanic, or whatever, I, you know. Read my blog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Sheila. Uh, I, know, well, I'll just, I'll just uh, I know you've been involved uh, over the years in the in ASPA, the American Society for Public Administration, uh, which has had an initiative uh, focused on the government uh, sector employee employees. Um, what I've noticed, I work in the VA. I've also noticed this at the state level is that our uh, employees uh, in the public sector are not as engaged uh, in civics as they used to be. I'm glad to hear the younger people are, but I notice comments like, well, you know, grumblings about politics, but what could I possibly do? And I grew up in an era where, you know, the bookkeeper at this, in, you know, for the city uh, was working the polls and, yeah. uh, you know, volunteered and registered people to vote. Uh, and so how do we, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on the government workforce and how to get them, uh, good people into government and have them engaged in helping uh, increase civic discourse? Well, there, there are a lot of questions there. First of all, having been a government employee who worked the polls and did that, I will tell you that <clears throat> we were encouraged. I mean, before, before uh, courts said, hey, you can't really make government workers volunteer, uh, you know, there's something inconsistent there between you have to and volunteer. Uh, so I'm not sure that it is all that much worse than it was, but uh, that said, if we're going to get good people into government, we're going to have to stop doing two things, underpaying them and bad-mouthing them. You know, this all started with Reagan saying government's not the solution, government's the problem. Well, we have had, what, 30 years of trashing the very enterprise of government. It shouldn't be too surprising that bright young people say, whoa, who'd want to do that? You know, that's for the losers. So I think Again, we have a cultural problem here, and that is we have to start recognizing the government is a good thing, and that uh, yes, government often oversteps or does things badly. So I would suggest to places like Enron, and you know, I mean, there's we have to re reinstitute terminology like public service and not snicker when you hear the words, you know. Uh, we have to really address this cultural bias in favor of the private sector. And I think I see some of that happening as, as this love affair with privatization uh, is beginning to yield its uh, rather f kind of foreseeable consequences, people are beginning to see. I just saw a study today, for example, that said that it, it was a study uh, that demonstrated what some of us have long suspected, which is that uh, contracting out for a government service costs more, actually, than having it done by in-house uh, workers. And that is obviously uh, dependent on the nature of the, the task. And you know, there are certainly times when contracting out makes sense. but. In America, we have this tendency of to be all or not. We're a very bipolar society. It's either good or bad. You know, it can't be. Well, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, and because that requires analysis and maybe thought, and you know, and we don't do that well. So I, you know, I think 
getting a little respect for government and government workers, and maybe showing some of that respect by paying them decently, uh, would be a nice thing. David. Um, as always, I appreciate your being able to take all these complex things and put them together in a way that just Being simple-minded helps. <laughs> but um, I, I, I get the impression, and, you know, reading your blog and, um, and, and listen, looking at the audience here, that you're really preaching to the choir. I know. That we all share kind of your viewpoints. And um, so my question is, if there are so many people here who share your viewpoint, why, I, I've often wondered why in Indiana, in, and, and perhaps picking on Indiana. Um, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I don't get this sense of outrage. I mean, I, I, I Oh, read my Facebook feed. <laughs> yeah. People you know, in, their, in front of their computers reading it, saying, yeah, yeah, she was right. And, God, this is really bad. But then, you know, in your little bio here, you said you lived through the and what character, and I lived through those areas, <laughs> what characterized those were protests, people getting out there. Yep. The, the outrage was tangible. You could see it on the, on the evening news. You could see it. You could participate in it. Mm -hmm. But here in Indiana, I don't get any sense. I get the sense of outrage. I know that there are people who are outraged. But I don't see anybody showing that out. So is this a Hoosier thing? Uh, oh, I hope not, because I was born here and I'll die here. But, uh, you know, I think certainly there are two things I, that I think. One is that uh, it's very easy to sign an online uh, uh, petition and feel like you've done something. So I think that in a sense, online activism, which also has the potential to really get people out on the streets, but it also has the potential to bleed off the, oh good, well I told them, I signed that petition. There's a petition going around, for example, to recall Pence, but we don't have a recall in Indiana. So, you know, <laughs> have fun, sign the petition, make, you know. Uh, but I also, <laughs> I will defer, my husband has been saying for the last, and, and I want to tell you all, he, we met in a Republican administration, we were both, Republican people, but he keeps saying, they can't keep this up, people will be in the streets. You've been saying that for 10 years now. I just, eventually, I have to believe that people will get angry enough that we, we will have some sort, it, history may be cyclical, but it never truly repeats. I mean, at some point, we will see some kind of 60s sort of thing. I, I, unless, of course, the Koch brothers buy up the streets. I don't know. I, just, I don't know. The older I get, the fewer answers I have, David. Just got lots of questions. No, no answers. Am I done? Oh, I'm not done. OK. I just want to know that there's a protest tomorrow at 1 o'clock at the state Yes. And the neat thing about that, I, there was Facebook again. A Facebook friend of mine who we've known for many, many years, who I have never known to take to the streets, ever. He is, he's one of these very cerebral, thoughtful people, sees both sides. You know, in fact, when I ran for Congress, he did my position papers, but he disagreed with me. You know, it was, <laughs> but, but he was, you know, he's going to that rally tomorrow at the State House. I was shocked. I mean, so maybe, maybe Dave, we're getting there, you know. Who knows? Well, we got there uh, just a few years ago with the uh, superintendent of public instruction. Yeah, that was where, good. Where, where the people of Indiana got so fed up with the, the comments and the cheating that went on that somebody did something about it. The people of Indiana did something about it. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. I'm old and well, deaf. Specifically, <laughs> specifically, my comments were that in the state of Indiana, the Department of Education, oh. when it was so blatantly crooked yeah. and, and, and biased on the whole thing, that the people of Indiana did something about it. They got the guts up and did something about it. Mm. They voted it out. Yeah. I think it is really, it, well, 
My optimistic side says that the reaction to Glenda Ritz's victory, which has been to divest her of all of her authority that people voted her in for, uh, was a huge political miscalculation because, you know, office holders by and large end up pissing people off. I, that's not the language I'm supposed to use, is it? Anyway, but you know, if they had let her alone, she would have been either popular or not popular. But now, even I have friends who are Republican school teachers who are so livid at what the governor's office has done that it's no longer about is she doing a good job, which I have no idea, but it is, listen, you, I voted for her and you took her, you, you negated my vote. So yeah, I mean, I think there is a lot of anger and it's a, there's a lot of very justified free flow. The question is, as David pointed out, are people going to act on that anger? Are they going to still be angry when the polls open? I, I don't know, I don't know, but I'm looking for a planet. <laughs> time I'm asking Professor Kennedy to stay here, don't go, and I would like to invite um, Dee uh, Metai to come up. She is the Vice President for Development of the Indiana University Foundation, and she is coming to the stage for a special presentation. Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon. It's truly, oh, we need that, don't we? <laughs> the honorarium. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it's truly a pleasure and privilege to be here. Uh, in preparing to present the honorarium to Professor Kennedy today, I wanted my remarks to be meaningful. To do that, I knew that I needed to learn more about our distinguished lecturer, and decided that I would Google you. <laughs> and Google I did. <laughs> so in addition to reading your summary statement for this lecture, which was inspiring, and reviewing your curriculum vitae, hugely impressive, I also read your blogs and learned your views about some of the following. <clears throat> SB 101, the Religious Freedom Act, voter registration in Oregon, Motor Voter, and uh, the City of Indianapolis's treatment of our homeless. I viewed your video, Civic Challenge Indiana on YouTube. I read through the synopses of your books, paying special attention to charitable choices at work, evaluating <clears throat> faith-based job programs in states, and I must say I appreciated the findings of your research. And I loved your article in the IBJ, If Lawmakers Could Be More Like Spock. <laughs> After this rather extensive scrutiny, I'm thrilled to know that this will not be your last lecture. I do wonder when you find time to sleep. And above, <laughs> and above all, I've grown to realize it is your unabiding passion and genuine concern that fuels your commitment to do all that is possible to create a far better village for the res residents of Indianapolis. Thank you, Professor Kennedy, for sharing your unique perspectives with us and in so doing, substantively influencing the larger community dialogue and advancing critical change. On behalf of the campus and Indiana University <coughs> Foundation, we are honored to support your presentation of the lecture today. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and to recognize this prestigious occasion. <laughs> Um, with this honorarium. And I'll give Dee her water after this, <laughs> down here. <laughs> Thank you, Dee. Um, now I, we have another.
cool thing here. We have a plaque from the Senior Academy for you to express our appreciation. Uh, this is for your all, I know you've prepared for this a lot, and we really appreciate an absolutely fabulous talk and your education, Calvin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, there is a reception after this, and uh, so we can continue. Um, if you, you can mob her, of course, but take your turns. Be nice. Uh, I, but before we go, I would like to recognize a few people that helped with, who helped with this event. Uh, first of all, I would like you to stand so we can see who you are. If you had enough time to come after all your hard work, enough energy. From the Office of Academic Affairs, Sue Harrell, who wrote a ton of emails and did a lot of work on this. Please stand. <laughs> Back there. Uh, Suzanne Christian, Lori Klosterman, Angie, Vinci Bucher. <laughs> And Christine Fitzpatrick. Thank you very much. From the IUPUI Senior Academy, uh, we had a uh, committee to make this uh, fantastic selection. And that was led by uh, David Stokem, an assistant. He's down there. Please stand. And assisting the committee, we had Simon Atkinson from Science, Phil Goff from Liberal Arts, Christine Fitzpatrick from Academic Affairs, Dee Matai from the Foundation, Pete Hunter from Student Leadership uh, at the IU Foundation. And I would also like to uh, recognize Debbie Collins, who is the Senior Academy Co-Coordinator. Co co 